Welcome everybody to Have History Real Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and today we will pick up where we left off in part one and dissect some of the scenes from the 2003 film, Gods and Generals. In this scene, the 20th Maine is attacking the Confederate position outside of Fredericksburg, and it demonstrates the chaos of battle and its impact on battle lines. You can see the 20th Maine's line bend, with some parts surging forward and some falling back. If a unit is taking part in its first major battle, like is shown in this scene, it fits perfectly with how units behaved in battle. Although veteran regiments would hold together more tightly, casualties would create a similar chaos even in the most experienced units. Another portion of the Battle of Fredericksburg that the movie demonstrates well is the swell and rise present on the field that thousands of Union soldiers approached and fell back behind to avoid the hail of lead and iron. I'll be doing an animated battle map in the beginning of December featuring Fredericksburg. If you would like to vote on which part of the battle to animate, head on over to the Patreon page and vote when the poll comes available. I love when movies utilize small historical details. If you look at General Jeb Stewart sitting on the right in this scene, you will notice what appears to be a red cockade or a red flower on his left lapel. Stewart loved the color red and would hardly ever be seen without a rose or some kind of flower or colorful red cockade on his uniform. So I have to give it up to the movie for this, for incorporating this small detail. General Jackson, do you know what these decorations signify? I was wondering if someone would tell me. This is Santa Sled. I see. I know a lot of people have problems with this movie dedicating a large portion of this movie to Jackson and this little girl. Could it have been left out? Absolutely. And honestly, it probably should have. However, Jackson was known as a stern individual in many respects, but he loved children, and when he would visit his nieces and nephews, he was known to crawl around on the floor playing with them. This shows a dimension of Jackson that you wouldn't normally hear about, but I agree, it should not have been in this film. This is a beautiful scene, soldiers from two different sides coming together to share a little supplies. Although the two sides fought bitterly against one another in numerous campaigns, that bitterness was not always present, especially when the two armies were close together and not on an active campaign. Scenes like this would happen. It speaks to the humanity in all of us. One reason I like these personal stories and heartwarming moments in a Civil War film is because we get overwhelmed with casualties in the hundreds of thousands and many times forget each number was an individual who had hopes, dreams, friends, family, and other loved ones. It simply humanizes the numbers, and I think that is important. And of brothers and native to the soil, fighting for our liberty from famine, war, and toil. And when our rights were threatened, the cry rose near and far. Here's another good example of a minute and a half to two minute scene that did nothing for the film in the long run. This musical interlude could have been used to show more battle scenes or critical moments of the war. However, the second South Carolina string band is featured and they have a wealth of talent. Again, I would rather have had scenes from Second Manassas or Jackson's Valley Campaign rather than the execution of deserters. But desertion is one thing I have found in countless armies and locations throughout the war. I have wrote multiple conference papers on the subject of desertion, and having a movie detail the outcome of finding a deserters guilty 
brings the war back to reality. No matter if the commanding generals were loved or not, both Union and Confederate armies saw massive amounts of desertion, especially when the armies were stationary. Martial arts. Any mail? No. But I did manage to get my hands on a New York Tribune. What are they saying about us now? Well, not much about us. I mean, that is this army here in Stoneman Switch. Sure, I'm kicking up a fuss about Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Oh, it says here that enlistments are down and desertions are up. Any grumbling among the men? Uh, not in our regiment. I mean, there are a few wondering out loud about why they should be risking their lives for the darkies. Well, Tom, you know my position. I signed up to preserve the Union, but I think the president did the right thing. What's the use of uniting the country by... F this scene also includes desertion in the form of conversation, as it is related to the Emancipation Proclamation. Union armies did see desertions as a result of the proclamation going into effect. Many of these soldiers enlisted to preserve the Union, and as the war aims evolved or changed, they felt it disagreed with their beliefs. A good example is Union General James G. Spears, a Tennessean and slave owner, who disagreed with the proclamation and was court-martialed for disloyalty when he allegedly spoke out against it. Now, somewhere out there is the Confederate Army. They claim they are fighting for their independence, for their freedom. Now, I cannot question their integrity. I believe they are wrong, but I cannot question it. But I do question a system that defends its own freedom while it denies it to others, to an entire race of men. I will admit it, Tom, war is a scourge, but so is slavery. It is the systematic coercion of one group of men over another. Just for the record, Jeff Daniels is Joshua Chamberlain. He excelled in this role and he delivers his dialogue beautifully. This scene only makes the myth of Jackson's love for lemons grow. I'm not saying he didn't like lemons, but his favorite fruit was peaches, as outlined in James I. Robertson's definitive work on Jackson. We, we must know. We must know. If he marches in that direction, he could threaten our flank or be gone toward Gordonsville before we can react. General Lee, sir, may I approach? Out here in the west along the stump pack here, the rat flank is in the air. It's the one place they're not digging in. But we must hit them there, then attack the flank. They will have nowhere to go, General Lee. They will have to go back across the river or we will destroy them. This is a very famous scene in Civil War history. General Lee had split his force, sending Longstreet south toward the peninsula in Virginia. Lee held a small part of the army at Fredericksburg and had Jackson march his entire force to the Union flank. Tactically, Jackson's flank attack is one of the greatest military movements in history. Arguably, Chancellorsville is Lee's greatest victory, demonstrating how a smaller force could defeat a larger one through rapid movement and secretive maneuvers. Although it is difficult to surmise from the way this battle scene is filmed, Jackson ordered an attack in depth, with his force split in three, stacked behind one another to give his attack even more punching power. They attempt to show that in the film, but I don't think it comes across that well. Nevertheless, seeing this famous maneuver come alive in a major motion picture thrills me as a military historian. You might ask yourself how Jackson could have snuck up on a Union right flank. It helps to remember that this battle took place in and around the wilderness that would become famous for the bloody engagement between Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant the next year. The dense forest was difficult to detect enemy movements. Sir. General Hill, you must keep the men moving. We must keep the pressure up, sir. 
Now we have broken their flank. We can crush them now. If we can cut them off, we must not give them the time to get themselves organized. General, you will take your division forward. You will press on to the north. You will move toward the river, toward the United States board. We must not let them escape, sir. It's late in the day, General. We don't know the ground. Boswell, you will ride with General Hill. You will find a way through the woods to the northeast. You will find the rear of the enemy's position. Yes, sir. We will cut them off, General. Jackson's persistence in pushing his men, even though battle lines were becoming entangled because of the dense forest and small pockets of enemy resistance, would be the general's downfall. He would be shot by his own men, thinking he and his staff were Union cavalry. Jackson had used the tactic of constant pressure during a retreat to great effect during his Valley Campaign, but the environment inhibited that type of tactic at Chancellorsville. When Jackson finally passes away from pneumonia after his wounding, the scene expands, showing Jim Lewis in the room. Although we don't know much about Jim, we do know that he was one of the few people who was able to freely come and go from Jackson's room as he helped take care of the general. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Please consider subscribing if you have not done so already. And if you would like to vote for the next animated battle map, don't forget to join the Patreon page. Thank you all and have a great day. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland. To educate the world is a professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian